use and uh, we also had a collaboration with UNFP, another collaboration with Ghana Reads Initiative and also with a prolific author. I'm calling her prolific author because I have read the book and I really found it interesting and I'm going to recommend that everyone gets to read this book. You grab it from wherever you find it because once you start reading this book, you will never want to stop. Well, I am delighted to let you know that the author is here with me. And uh, I also have another fine lady also here with me. But before we go there, we would always let you know what's happening with women here in Ghana and across Africa under our 60 Seconds Update segment coming up now. Do stay tuned. Asla Owusu Ekufo, Minister of Communications and Digitalization, has hinted that plans are advanced for government to use ICT initiatives to transform the newly created regions to meet the development needs of the people. This was said at the gathering at the climax of the AHAFO Regional Girls in ICT initiative, spearheaded by the ministry to ensure that the newly created regions become a priority. According to her, this explains why this year's Girls in ICT is being celebrated in five of the new regions created with the training of 5,000 basic school girls. More than 3,000 menstruating girls in Amasaman cluster of schools in the Ghan West municipality of the Greater Accra region have been provided sanitary pads as Ghana joins the world to mark Menstrual Hygiene Day. A collaboration between an NGO, Inspired Today, MTN Ghana Foundation and other corporate institutions is aimed at reducing the rising cases of sex for sanitary parts among adolescent girls in Ghana. The Amasaman cluster of schools will be the 17th cluster to receive support from the Inspired Today Foundation. More than 3,000 girls received sanitary towels, bathing soap, roll-ons, shaving sticks and educational materials to mark this year's World Menstrual Hygiene Day. Senior Manager in Charge of Corporate Communications at MTN Ghana, Georgina Asarif Yagbenu, seized the opportunity to encourage the girls to be intentional about their goals. Roma Africa, producers of Jama Soap and A Life supply the girls with soap to promote good menstrual hygiene. Founder of Inspire Today, Etanam Se, expressed worry about a recent report by Plan International Ghana revealing that 83% of adolescent girls interviewed in Wa East sleep with men in exchange for sanitary parts. She has meanwhile expressed gratitude to world readers, step publishers, Lady Bird of Zen Petroleum, Arla Foods, producers of Dano Milk, and Fun Mall Ghana Limited for their consistent support in helping to keep the girl child in school. Inspire Today Foundation is a network organization nurturing a nationwide movement of female leaders through a concerted effort at achieving the Sustainable Development Goals 3 and 5, which is promoting good health and well-being and enforcing gender equality. And you're welcome back to ETV Ghana's African Women's Voices show. It's about time to introduce my guests. And they are seated here and poised to share all the knowledge they've got around how we're going to be raising our girl children. So to my immediate left, we have Linda Ampa. She is a prolific author and she wrote this very beautiful book, which is titled Pieces of the Portrait. This is the book that she wrote. And I believe you will enjoy it when you begin to read the book. We're going to tell you where you can find it later on in the show. So most of us know Linda Ampa as uh, the CEO of Catlin Fashions. Actually, I always knew her for that. Mm -hmm. So at some point, I even didn't remember her name. Catlin Fashions is what you always hear before she you know, even speaks, is Catlin Fashions. So today, you get to meet her up close and personal, and then she gets to talk more about how to raise your girl child. But welcome to the show. Thank you. You're welcome. So seated right next to her is another lady who is so outspoken that I have come to meet and I am really happy I met with her. She is very active when it comes to human rights and she is uh, known as Sharifa Awudu. You're welcome to the show. Thank you. Great. So ladies, we are going to be talking about how best we could raise our girl children. 
it's not like our mothers are not doing enough. However, because of some situations in society and how we are all growing and overlooking certain things, things are still not really in shape as they should. Maybe because we are getting modernized, we are beginning to see that some of the old things, uh, we could modify it a little bit. So we are not saying to you mothers and fathers that what you did for us in the past is all wrong, no. Today, we want to also bring another perspective to what you've always known. And we hope that you open up your hearts and your minds to receive our suggestions. Thank you very much. Okay, so looking at the book, this is what is inspiring the conversations today. Uh, as mentioned earlier, we actually were part of a reading uh, platform where we read to girls about how to take care of themselves uh, during the menstruation. And during this session, we also read this book, some chapters. So the girls are educated on some aspects of this book and we we'll want you to get it for them to read the rest of it. And the author is here. It's actually her autobiography. She wrote it herself. And I like to say something that she's written at the back. She says, this book for parents will share some important strategies on how to protect and empower our daughters. It questions some of the traditional approaches we've adopted as a society in dealing with problems that girls face, like understanding their bodies and sexuality. It boldly touches on taboo issues like rape, sexual abuse, pedophilia, and incest, which are very prevalent in our society, but are swept under the rug to protect society at large, while the victims are left to suffer in silence. This book tells us some uncomfortable truths we need to hear so that we can set up and protect the precious girls and women God has put in our lives. So get ready for the uncomfortable truths. Are we ready? Let's go. So, Linda, could you just take us back to those times when you were 12 years old? Let's try to live through this book. When you were 12, did you have aspirations at that time or it was too early to talk about aspirations? I actually did. I actually did. I wanted to dress people up. So my mother was into garment manufacturing. So I actually grew up making clothes. And I saw her doing it. I enjoyed doing it. So that's all I wanted to do was to transform people's um, look, make them feel good about themselves. So that's what I always wanted to do as a child. Wow, amazing. You wanted to dress mm -hmm. people up because mm -hmm. that was what you saw when you were growing yes. up. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's move over to Sharifa. Sharifa, uh, because we are going to be addressing adolescents, mm -hmm. um, let's kind of open it up to the adults who are watching today. At what point should we begin to discuss reproductive health or sexuality with our adolescents? I think when we talk about reproductive health, it's very um, important that we start talking to children as early as possible. So as early as they begin to communicate with you um, as a parent or you know a teacher, for example, for people who are in educational settings. When we talk about reproductive education, it's not just about talking about only the one that makes us uncomfortable, which is about talking about reproductive organs or just sec our sexual organs. It goes as far as talking about basic life skills like hygiene, basic life skills like being able to take care of yourself, to wash, to brush your teeth, for example, and then be able to teach these children as young as possible to be able to confide in you as a parent, as a mother, as a father, or as a teacher in school. So most of the time, it's, it was quite disheartening reading um, Auntie Linda's book because in our world now, especially in Ghana, children as young as below 10 years are all getting defiled, they are all getting harassed. But they do not know that when someone touches you inappropriately, touches you or says something inappropriate to you, you need to tell your parents to be able to deal with it. When we look at just n not just touching, but also just saying things, the problem now also is we don't even know what is inappropriate. We do not tell or teach our children to know what is inappropriate. And the question also comes, who defines what inappropriateness is? So I think for children, for adolescents, 
there is a thing where we call age appropriateness. As and when they grow, you increase the amount of information you give them. But the most important thing is to make sure that there is that comfort, there is that safe space for a child, whether it, an adolescent, um, an infant, or a, a baby should be able to communicate one way or the other to you as a mother. Yes. Mm. Great. All right, you know, when Sharifa was talking, she talked about defilement and um, how we are supposed to be given the right kind of information as the child grows. As you were growing up, did you have this kind of orientation? Oh, you're not supposed to be touched in this place and that place. Were you told something like that? No, nobody talked to me about my body, even as I was growing up and all the changes that is going to take place in my body. Nobody talked to me about that. I didn't know what the warning signs were. I didn't know what to run away from. I didn't know what red flags was. I mean, I didn't know anything. And today, everywhere you look, there's sex everywhere. Uh, social media, it's there on television, music videos, it's all over. So children know a lot more than that time. Because that time, there was no internet. There was no cable TV. So. Oh, the, the worst you see was osophodizing. Mm -hmm. I'm sure many, many of <laughs> the young people don't know what osophodizing is. Yes, you know what it is. Yeah? <laughs> She's guilty as well. Uh, you see? <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it was a local account drama. And every once in a while, there will be some sex scenes. And even that sex scene will be like a hug mm -hmm. or maybe a kiss on the on their cheek or something like that. That was how far the they could it, go. it was a big deal then, you know. Mm. But we didn't have any exposure to any of those things. So completely naive. I had no clue. Wow. So according to your book, would you want to say something? Yeah, I think it's very interesting that Auntie Linda has highlighted how far we've come as a country and as a people. And um, I just also want to highlight that it's important for us to also acknowledge this journey that we've embarked on. So the older generation had a completely different experience. My generation, we, are having a, we had a completely different experience. And I think the next generation are also having a completely different experience. So it's about acknowledging the differences in generation mm -hmm. and being able to accommodate or do things, take measures to accommodate the changing times. Mm -hmm. So now we have a lot of soft, um, I don't want to say, but sometimes soft porn through our music videos, which we enjoy watching. They're on TV, they're on social media. Sometimes even radio adverts say a lot of things that you know, sparks the curiosity of young people and children. And this includes adolescents, be it lower, um, younger adolescents or older adolescents. So it's important for us to take knowledge of this one. So we are able to imbibe it in our children to acknowledge it, welcome it, because, I mean, there's nothing, very little we can do about the well. changing <laughs> times. So accept yes. it and work with it. That's right. I like the work with it. <laughs> work with it. <laughs> yes, it is what it is. Yes. You know, and I feel that um, as parents, I think that we have an opportunity to begin such conversations. It's easier because it's out there. Yeah. So you can pick one and use it as a conversation piece. Um, suppose to compare to the older times when there was nothing. How do you even start a conversation like that with your child? You know, so I don't, as you rightly said, we are not faulting our parents. They could only do what they knew how yeah. to do, you know, so you can't fault them. But today there's a lot out there. It's all around us. So we have something to start a conversation with. A music video, as you um, uh, mentioned, is a good place to start. So a video comes up and there are sex scenes in there. I think it's a great opportunity for a parent to begin that conversation with your child. Your child. Yeah. All right, so we'll go for a quick question break. When we return, we'll talk about how um, it's supposed to be a surprise. But I'm, I always divulge it. But anyway, I'm already saying it, so let's just go ahead and say it. It happened that Linda was defiled by a family member. And it's in the book. Okay? That's why I needed to get this book. So when we return, we get to find out how it affects children of her age if people they trust so much in their family uh, end up being the ones that defile them. Do not go away. <laughs> And you're welcome back to the show. So before we went on the break, I 
talked about the fact that once we come back, we are going to be getting deeper into family members who end up defiling, you know, younger ones within the family. Uh, one would always think that within the family, there's security, there's safety. So if there's any danger, it's coming, it's becoming from outside. But in some cases, the danger actually looms within. And here we have someone who experienced this kind of danger that was looming within, and we'll get to hear her share her story. So Linda, let's delve into the aspect where someone you really trusted was the one who took away what you really cherished from you. So, um, as you rightly said, a lot of these things happen in homes, compound houses, office, school setting, because it's easier for somebody you trust or know to lure you into their room. It's very easy because you trust them. You don't expect anything bad um, from them, you know. So if somebody calls you into their room, a cousin, a friend, a classmate, and a colleague uh, in church, you know, a, a choir member or pastor, you know, it's very easy. And that's what happens in a lot of cases. And in my case, it was a cousin who was living with us. In our house, we had cousins. We had about six or seven cousins who were living with us in the home. You know, so this is somebody you trust. And so if he calls you into the room, and of course, you didn't even know any better. So if somebody calls you into their room, they are either calling you to send you to do something, or usually something like that, or maybe punish you for something you have done. You know, so very naively and foolishly, you know, so that happened. And it's, it seems like it's still today, we are still not equipping our young people um, to know what the red flags are. Um, I, I'm still seeing it today. After I, I brought this book out, I hear a lot of cases. People come to me with issues like that. And I realize it's still happening today. So people are still the same way I was over 35, 40 years ago. It's still the same. We still trust. We still believe that, oh, this can never happen. My stepfather would never do that. Oh, my father never. You know, my colleague. And it's happening today. I hear cases all the time. Women, young women, young girls, you know, and it's all happening. And there's always somebody around. The mm. strangers, uh, you hardly will fall for a stranger calling you into a room, you know, that one, you're aware that, no, 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 this one, I don't know this person, so you won't let your guard down. But when it's somebody you know, or a relation, it's a completely different story. And that's what is happening. Hmm. She mentioned red flags. Can you share with us some of the red flags that, you know, people really need to look out for, or parents who are watching us right now should educate their children you know, around? I think red flags takes so many forms. It depends on the person pulling out the red flag. Mm. Um, I think the common ones we would hear or the common ones we were told growing up have to do with, oh, buy something for me and bring it to my room. Um, you know, go to my room and pick something for me and then they follow up. There's been instances where teachers have been, um, have given books to children to take home you know, things like that. And um, sometimes also, there are times where guardians are the uh, gatekeepers of these actions. So you find there's been stories of um, news articles published where you find that parents are cooking food, they are giving to their teenagers, their adolescents to go and give to a teacher who has been sent in from the city to come to the community to teach, and all these things are um, ways where you, you leave these young people vulnerable. However, I think there are a lot of things that we also overlook. There are times where within our culture, there, there's a lot of Accommod accommodative behavior towards predatory actions of, you know, abusers. This includes you find an old man or an elderly person in your community jokingly, and I'm putting jokingly in quotes because I do not find them as jokes. Mm -hmm. um, my wife, mm. you sit on their laps, mm. and these are men who are of no relations, blood relations to you. You are exposing yourself in a way. 
um, there are so many ways where we can actually go. If we start with the red flags, we are not going to end now. There is also the key main, um, oh, another key um, red flag that has to do with consent. Um, so sometimes young girls who do not kotow to some of these practices or norms uh, that have been so, you know, normalized <laughs> for us, for lack of a better way to phrase it, are seen as too known, are seen as disrespectful. So when it, an older person sends you, oh, buy me a pack of um, pure water and bring it to my room, or buy me this and bring it to my room, and you bring it out and say, okay, come out for it, it's a problem. Mm. And our parents, you know, uh, punish us or admonish mm. us for doing for seeing some of these things. Mm. So the red flags, they take so many forms. But the most important thing is knowledge of boundaries, knowledge of individual. I think these two things are very important when we are able to, for us to be able to spot red flags. For some people, it is OK because they feel they are strong enough. If their colleague adolescents should make a pass at them, they feel they can fight themselves, like fight their way out of it. There are other people who feel they do not stand the chance of fighting. So someone who, for example, feels like I stand a chance of beating this boy if he tries to do something towards me, might approach certain situations differently from someone who do not feel very physically capable. So I think um, they take so many forms. So that's why it's important for us to be able to train these girls to be able to spot some of these things that will make them uncomfortable and are able to spot certain things that qualify as red flags. And even if it's a pink flag, um, it's important for us to tell that pink flag, pink is very close to red. Mm -hmm. So even if you see a pink flag, run away run from away. it. Mm -hmm. Talk to your parents about it. And sadly, there are times where for some adolescent girls, the people they can report to are the same people abusing the them. Mm. There are cases where fathers or stepfathers mm. or brothers, mm. the male figures in the house mm. are the same perpetrators. Mm. So it becomes difficult mm. for some of these girls. Mm. So in this case, what is a red flag for mm. this girl? Because it's a means of survival. I, if I speak, I'm going <sighs> to be in trouble. If I do not speak, the abuse is going to continue. Mm. So that's why we need to have a system in place for them to be able to report if they are not able to report within the nuclear family. If the mother figure or if the father figure is not someone they can easily uh, report to, there should be a system in place that they should be able to report to. And hopefully towards the end of this discussion, I will share the um, toll-free number of the Orange Support Center, and I will talk more about the Orange Support Center. as anyway. Great. Wow. I think another thing I would like to add is um, um, the importance of placing value on our bodies. Yeah. Um, that's another area that um, I think as parents we need to really focus on. Teach your child to value their bodies because if you place value on the body, then you will not allow anybody to touch it anyhow. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very important that you know that this is mine, this is who I am, I am precious, I am beautiful, this, this is who I am, nobody is allowed to come into this space. You know, and I think that once you teach your child this, they grow up valuing themselves. They know that they are worth something. In a lot of cases, I realize that um, they don't, they, we don't value ourselves because we haven't been taught to do so. So we don't even know what we are worth. So then if you, if you don't value it, then if somebody comes touching, it's not a big deal. It's not a big deal Exactly. At all. You know, so I even, in my book, I talk about um, children even bathing in the streets. Yes, you might not have a, um, a bathroom, but you can protect your child by putting maybe a cloth around where they bath. Don't let them bath in public because if they do that, they are not placing any value on their body. You should protect it. It's yours. You know, it's your space. So things like that, I think we need to um, teach our children that. It would help a lot. Okay. Would you want to add to it? Yeah, I think um, it's very important. It's very nice that um, Aunt Linda has mentioned this. And I'm just thinking, perhaps it could also be associated with the culture that the woman's body is meant to satisfy the man. Mm. So from childhood, we are basically socialized to have at the back of our minds that at the end of the day, 
it's a man that's going to have to that's going to have access to our body your body is not yours it's for your husband so even when you're growing up your upbringing is molded in a way that is fit for the ideal standards of a man so when children are socialized this way growing up there is very less um, self-worth for them and consciously and I mean consciously and unconsciously so these also play some kind of barriers so our traditional way of socialization also have huge implications you find men complimenting women and I'm again putting complimenting in quotes mm -hmm. oh you have a nice buttocks your breast is molding out really nice hey now you're a, you're a big woman look mm -hmm. at your chest mm -hmm. all these things are some of the red flags so many ways that these red flags can take it's not as inappropriate mm. for you to comment on a woman's body especially a teenager an adolescent who is still growing because usually at those formative ages there are a lot of hormonal influence there are a lot of things that can easily influence them they feel on top of the world they feel everything revolves around, around them. them it's a learning you know stage for teenagers and adolescents so obviously there's that social cultural influence on how we think and how we respond to situations so if for me if i say do not compliment me by saying i have nice breasts it might seem offensive to the average you know guardian whilst for other people it's a compliment that you should be proud of when a man says oh you're beautiful you have nice hair your breast is you know voluptuous you have a nice shape these are seen as compliments which under normal circumstance really shouldn't especially if it's coming from a strange meal or you know a meal that shouldn't even be complimenting to your body okay. in the first place so i definitely agree with what auntie linda is saying okay so uh, a lot seems to be revolving around the family, our culture, society and all. Uh, I'd like to come to Linda to find out how did your family, you know, how did they treat you when the defilement happened? What was it like? Was it um, comforting or was it like more like fault finding? How did you really feel within the family when the situation came up? Well, as I think we've mentioned this earlier, none of none of us are equipped to handle situations like that. So typical yeah. Ghanaian mother, my my mother was a single mother. Um, of course, you're a bad girl. You caused this. How did you let this happen? Oh, no, no, no. This cousin can't do that. He's such a fine gentleman. You are the bad girl. You know, things like that. So then all hell breaks loose in your own home. And then this is a space where you should feel protected, but rather you are rather feeling like you are, uh, you are the culprit, you see. So um, as much as we also um, educate the young girl, we should also help the parents also. Because in cases that I've seen and dealt with after writing this book, a lot of the parents, they also don't know what to do. Mm. So... Um, yes, the police case begins, and then after a little while, it is settled out of court. court. Because number one is the family name, you are dragging the family name um, into the mud, um, everybody's going to know about you, you will not be able to get a husband, uh, you know, things like that. So then in so-called protecting the family name, you die a victim. Nobody's looking out, out for how you're surviving. How are you coping? What are you doing? How are you surviving? How are you going to pull through this? They are not interested in that. They are interested in the family name. Yeah. Wow. So we'll go for another commercial break. When we return, we are going to be looking at how some of these things that happen to some of us as women, how it's really affecting our marriages and how we need the support of our spouses to get through this to not go away and you're welcome back to etv ghana's african women's voice show where we're discussing how we can better empower our girl children uh, if you're just joining us well you've missed out on quite a lot but it'll be good for you to sit and enjoy the rest of the show all right so before we went on the break we talked about how family members 
instead of being supportive or caring or understanding, rather accuse us of being the reasons why certain bad things happen to us. So if you're a family member and you are having to do that to another girl in the family, please uh, make a U-turn. We want to have a better society after this discussion. And uh, please, the phone lines are also going to be opened for you to call and then express yourself. You could also drop your comments on our Facebook page about what you feel uh, throughout the conversation. All right? So we'll activate the phone lines very soon. I'll announce it, and then you can call. Great. So um, let's just come over to you. Uh, I wouldn't want people to miss this. If a girl child, could even be a boy child, because I'm mm -hmm. sure that your center listens to both boys and girls. Mm -hmm. If someone or an adolescent is going through a situation of abuse um, or defilement, and he or she is not able to speak up to maybe family members, because the people that they ought to talk to are the ones who are actually perpetuating the situation what should they do who should they call i think that um if all channels of reporting is exhausted and they really need someone to talk to um the domestic violence um secretariat is the dv secretariat of the ministry of gender children and social protection with support from united nations population fund have set up the orange support center so the, what the Orange Support Center does is it just listens to calls and provides, provides help to victims or survivors, as I would like to call them. So be it legal help, psychosocial help, medical help, it's your one-stop center for all cases of abuse. And the number is totally free. It's a toll-free number. So for the viewers, you can call 0800-111-222. Wow, very simple. Very simple. Let's take it again. <laughs> it's 0800-111-222. And um, you get to report, submit a report, and um, all the help that you need will be provided as much as um, the center is able to. And like I mentioned before, it is the one-stop shop. So everything you possibly might need, uh, in every case of abuse, be it rape, be it defilement, be it sexual harassment, you will find it um, when you call this toll-free number. So, um, yes, we really hope that uh, we stop this culture of silence. I really hope that people who are survivors of abuse, survivors of rape, are able to call these numbers, make their, uh, tell their stories, make their cases known, and have these perpetrators punished. Most often, like Auntie Linda mentioned earlier on, Cases go to court, then family go in, they bring it out, they say they're trying to sol solve it the family way, and it's swept under the carpet. There is no form of, you know, psychological support for the survivors. And these actually do have a toll on their mental health, and sometimes their general health. So they carry this load, they carry this weight throughout their life. They are not able to even share it again because there's a bit of shame that comes along with it. So for people who are not also able to mention their names, there's also that anonymity when you call the center to report. So I really hope the viewers have gotten this number right. Let's take it like one more I time. Like I said, it's 0800-111-222. And it's being run by the DV Secretariat of the Ministry of Gender, Children and Social Protection. It's not the Ministry of Women Affairs, it's the Ministry of Gender. So it means anybody at all can call, whether male or female, child, please do not keep your story to yourself. Make sure you call, make sure you're ahead, and make sure you get help. Okay. All right. So before we went on the break, I mentioned that sometimes when women are victims of uh, abuse uh, or defilement, it translates into the relationship that they build you know, in later on in life, even in their marriages. I'd uh, like Linda to share with us um, the kind of support we expect from spouses. You know, you've already talked about family members not being supportive sometimes. Some family members, you know, by they accuse you of being bad, uh, being the reason why certain bad things happen to you. So let's talk to the spouses now. If you end up with a, a lady who probably confides in you that, look, something happened to me. I've not been able to talk about it. But as my spouse, I want to tell you this. Could you share what spouses can do to support their wives? 
All right, for somebody who has gone through this, you tend to have trust issues. You don't mm -hmm. trust. So it takes a long time to begin to trust. And therefore, when you find yourself in a relationship and the spouse eventually um, does something that breaks that trust, mm -hmm. that's it. It's very, very difficult to come back. You know, because it's, it takes a long time. So people who have gone through such situations, you need a lot of love, a lot of patience, understanding. And it's a constant thing. It's taking me a long time to get to this stage. A lot of confidence building, a lot of um, trusting, you know, so... Everybody is a suspect. Mm. Everybody is a suspect. And then, in my case, I had a daughter as well. Oh, Lord. Then, then any man who crosses is a suspect. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so oh, it's, it's oh. A, it can be a problem. Mm. It can be a problem. So we need a lot of patience. We need a lot of understanding. And con uh, constantly telling us that, we're good, we're okay, you know, because you've gone through a situation where you feel worthless, you feel, you feel like uh, there's nobody cares about you, and therefore when you get to that stage where you have found somebody who actually loves genuinely, mm -hmm. it's not easy to let go, you know, so it takes a lot of understanding on their part. I was blessed to have a husband who is very, very understanding, you know, who works with me. He works with me. Sometimes you fall back, then you start again. You know, you get to a stage. Then you are like, okay, we are plateauing. Then you, st you know, so it's a lot of patience, a lot of understanding, a lot of loving, a lot of uh, coaching. It, it, it takes a lot. It takes a lot. And it's not a one day matter. It's a continuous, continuous. Out there, you have psychologists where... Um, people have psychologists they go to for the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. You know, thankfully now here too it's available. Um, now Kolebu even has a whole unit that you can actually go and, and get help. You know, so for the older women who uh, have still not been able to talk about this, now you can get a psychologist to talk to, and who can help you to come out of. Because. Um, I realized that talking about it heals. It brings mm. a lot of healing. Mm. It's helped me a lot. You know. Okay, great. So as we round up, Sharifa, if you can uh, talk to parents for us, how can they earn or what would they have to do to earn the trust of their adolescent children to be able to confide in them? <laughs> you know, because a lot of times... Uh, we feel like we don't want to have this kind of discussion with our parents. No, 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 no. I don't think they're going to understand. They're going to begin to suspect me. So anybody who calls, because I've told them that I like this guy or I like this girl, every time the person comes around, they are so, you know, they're always watching me. I don't want to discuss it. How can we as parents, you know, earn the trust of our adolescent children? Well, first of all, I am not a parent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I am not sure how I would... Um, handle this question if I were a parent but as a young person and someone who had parents guidance um, growing up I think the most important thing is communication and I say this with um, a bit of caution because if there's anything I've learned also is that it's one thing to talk about something when it doesn't have to do with you or people really close to you it takes a moment of consciousness mm. for you to bring yourself back and really think about the repercussions of what you're doing. What are the advantages? You know, wh what do I have? What am I working with? Because I do have siblings, <laughs> and um, as the eldest daughter, there are times where I really want to openly have conversations with my younger sister, but it is really difficult. But it's easy for me to have this conversation with someone else's sister so it's that moment of consciousness to bring yourself back and to be able to acknowledge that my sister like any other young girl out there is prone is vulnerable to all these issues that we are discussing 
my younger sister is not a superhero. So as a young person, I would really want our parents to stop seeing us as perfect children, trying to mold us into perfect children, because it's, in, it's through mistakes that we actually learn. Mm. And when we make mistakes, we want to be able to bring ourselves, report to you, and be able to engage with you, to be able to learn from these mistakes. So I, I think that's the key thing. Communication and constant you know, reminder that they were once children, what they needed in their parents, they should be you know, that figure of guidance that they needed when, you know, they had parents. But like I said earlier on, I don't have a child. <laughs> <laughs> I'm speaking <laughs> from a young person's point yes, of view. Exactly well. the reason why I had to and ask, because <laughs> we would well. want to know what the young person I know it's actually is thinking. I know it's really difficult <laughs> sometimes, but yeah, yeah but try yeah. to communicate with mm. us. I think that um, as a parent, we need to have a very welcoming attitude. Mm. And we have to be very conscious and deliberate about opening ourselves up and allowing our children to open up to us without being judgmental. They go through a lot. And as we mentioned earlier, today, sex is all over. They are slapped with sex everywhere they go. So if you don't open up to them and allow them to come and feel free and tell you about what is going on in their lives. Believe me, they will take the information out there mm -hmm. yeah. and it will be wrong information, most likely. So we need to open up. Look, there are words, our sexual organs, for instance, in our language, we don't even mention it. We don't, it's a taboo. So if you're, we have all kinds of nicknames for our private parts, why? Meanwhile, when we're speaking English, you can say vagina, mm -hmm. you can say penis. Mm -hmm. So why can we not say it in our language? Uh, we have yeah. to say sebi. Ah, thank you. <laughs> you see? <laughs> so sebi. let's be open about it. Let's talk about it. So when there's something going on in your child's life, they'll be able to come to you and discuss with you without feeling that you're going to judge them. There's nothing, last she said, they will make mistakes along the line. It's okay for them to come to you with their mistakes. You know, and cry with them. It's mm. all right. It's okay. Powder their faces and then you continue the journey. Oh. <laughs> How I hate to say this, it's time for us to go. Mm -hmm. And time didn't permit us to open the phone lines. However, you can send in your comments. I've seen a comment here from Zulaiha. He says, Sharifa, I would be doing the most. And then somebody is asking here, she's Salamat, she's asking, how do we get the book? We will not let her go without saying to us <laughs> where we can get the book. So please, let's know where we can right. get this beautiful book. I'm okay. telling you, we're just brushing all over it. <laughs> if you get to read the book itself, you see a whole lot more that we didn't say here. And we intentionally didn't say everything because we needed to get the book. <laughs> all right so please where can we get all it right. so it's on amazon you can get it on amazon you can buy it from challenge bookshop assemblies of god bookshop kingdom bookstore mm -hmm. you can get them there as well, well great mm -hmm. great and i also have another one here from unfp the adolescence info pack uh this was shared at the um menstrual uh, chat session we had and uh, it was really insightful because when I went through it, I saw quite a number of things that people had to know, even from the age of 10, as young as that, they needed things to know. And it's in this book. Is there a place that parents can get this book? No, unfortunately. Okay. Um, but I think there, I, I can refer, I can, you know, make inquiries and get back to you so you can tell the um, viewers. However, there's been occasions where like um, outreaches or activities like what we had um, last week, we've shared it amongst young people to have access to it. And I'm not sure if um, some of the partners will also be sharing it, but then we have other organizations who also um, write to UNFPA to get the info pack and they share amongst their young people. Okay. Yes, unfortunately it's not available for sale, but we, I can only make inquiries and get back to you on where we can, you know, get, get more of it. All right, that's fantastic. <laughs> All right, so please, uh, this is where we have to draw the curtain. I'd like to appreciate Afriwa Styles for this outfit of mine. If you want to get something contemporary for ladies and gents, please go to Afriwa Styles, okay? She's located at Osu and also at the Teshinungwa um, area, at the container bus stop particularly. All right, so when you go there, you step in and you step out with a dress. It's already made. 
So don't think of, oh, they're going to tell me lies. Oh, they'll say this. Oh, they'll say, ah, it's ready. Step in and step out with what works for you. Her number is right now at the base of your screen. And then uh, Leap Tomato Mix also has made sure that jollof rice tastes really good. So no matter what kind of rice it is, if it is Spanish rice, Chinese rice, Senegalese rice, Nigerian rice, whatever rice, the secret ingredient is Leap Tomato Mix. And we have also got Chana Shito. Chana Shito is Ghana's number one pepper sauce. If you've not tried it, I like Chana with fried egg. I also try it with bread and it's so good. You may have what you like to take with uh, your pepper sauce, but this is what I prefer. Please move out to your vendor and get Chana Shito. Her number is also right now at the base of your screen. Call her and buy and give out. We are looking for extra income streams, right? Buy Chana Shito. It's cheap and people buy. They buy, they buy, they buy, they buy. And my hair was put together by Awo's hair. Awo, thank you so much. If you want a wig cap, she can do it. If you want to fix weave on, if you want the hair pieces, she can sort you out. Find her on Instagram and Facebook at Awo's hair. So until we meet next week, do enjoy the rest of our interesting lineup for you. Bye-bye.